so our research began with a simple premise. The National Security Agency is bound by legal rules. And real legal rules, not imaginary legal rules. Rules that actually have the force of law. But there's a problem. So, right, my people designed these rules. Uh, these rules were designed by lawyers. Uh, lawyers on the Supreme Court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, uh, lawyers in the executive branch, Department of Justice within the NSA. And those rules are based on a set of technical assumptions. And so it seemed to us worth asking, are those technical assumptions accurate? And so we did two major projects on the National Security Agency's authority. One on the agency's authority with respect to international internet traffic, and one project on the NSA's authority with respect to domestic phone metadata. And today, I want to talk a bit about our research on phone metadata. So there are several assumptions made by the NSA's attorneys, uh, one being that phone metadata isn't identifiable, another being that phone metadata isn't densely interconnected. So the rules surrounding the NSA's program said you can look at not just one person's phone metadata, but the people they talk to, one hop out, and then the people they talk to, that's two hops out, and in fact go all the way to three hops out. And the assumption was that wouldn't sweep in too many people. And then the last assumption was that this isn't really sensitive information. It's just numbers dialed, numbers that called you, how long you talked, when you talked. What's the big deal? OK. So to, so to do research in this area, our first problem was how are we going to get our hands on a bunch of phone metadata and ground truth about those people the metadata belonged to? And our first thought was like, OK, why don't we just ask some telecoms? Um, and I, I think I heard like a chortle slightly over there. Um, right, we actually got laughed at. Um, no way was a telecom going to give us this information. So we had this pie in the sky notion. Why don't we crowdsource the information? Why don't we ask people politely and see if they'll give it to us? So we wrote this Android application, called it Metaphone, put it in the Google Play Store, uh, and, uh, and let people install it and give us their phone metadata. Uh, and you bet we checked with the Stanford IRB and had an informed consent right there in the app. Uh, uh, by the time we concluded our study, we had almost 1,000 uploads using the app. Uh, and I want to share three results from our research today. Uh, the first on the identifiability of phone metadata. In fact, at one point, even the president said, what's the big deal? It's just phone numbers. Uh, and so we looked at a bunch of data sources that would map phone numbers to individuals' names, to businesses' identities, uh, and just using free resources and just a little bit of elbow grease, we got to over 90% mapping phone numbers to people and businesses. So this notion that it's just a phone number, where's the name, it's not a big deal, turns out to not really be true. OK, so that was the first research result. The second result I want to share is on the structure of the phone call graph. Um, and again, the, the structure matters a lot because the NSA's rules are, are written in such a way that uh, they can look several hops out from a suspect. And so our initial thinking was that uh, <laughs> right, it was going to look like this, that you know, everyone calls maybe a few dozen people. They, in turn, call a few dozen people. They call a few dozen. Multiply it out, right? the Kevin Bacon effect. So that's what we thought it was going to look like. And we really didn't think we'd be able to say much about uh, the interconnectivity of phone metadata, because we thought our participants just weren't going to be talking to each other that much. We thought, we have this really scattershot sk sample of people on the internet. All things considered, we're not looking at that much uh, is in a time window, just a few months of metadata. Uh, and all things considered, not that many people sending us our metadata. So we thought we wouldn't be able to say much about this issue. Uh, it turned out we were totally wrong. Um, so. Uh, uh, so let me just give you some call graphs to give you a sense of what the phone graph looks like. Uh, so these blue dots are our participants, and you can see just two participants talk directly to each other. So not, not a lot of communication directly between our participants. Now let me add in uh, the most commonly called number uh, among our participants is T-Mobile voicemail. So lots of participants have a T-Mobile phone configured to dial into their voicemail. Every one of those people is within two hops of everyone else with a T-Mobile phone configured to dial into their T-Mobile voicemail. Let me add in some more edges. Uh, so uh, here we have Skype, 
Right, so people who have received calls from a Skype number, it turns out Skype uses a limited set of numbers to call people. So if you've, re if you've received a call on your ordinary phone from someone using Skype, odds are good you're, or, or odds are good you're two hops away from everyone who's gotten a Skype call. Um, so that's pretty densely interconnected. Let's add some more. Um, so uh, now you can see uh, telemarketers are starting to show up in our data set. Um, so they just make the NSA's job easier, right? They call lots and lots of people, putting them within two hops of each other. Uh, and add some more, and add some more. Uh, and so, again, it turns out we were totally wrong. The phone graph is really densely interconnected. Um, and so this notion of, well, you can only look two or three hops out, turns out to really be not much of a limit. Okay. So now let me uh, touch on the third research result I want to share, and that is drawing sensitive inferences from phone metadata. And I just want to give you two vignettes from our data set. Uh, so we had one participant who received a lengthy phone call from a local medical center, then had a lengthy phone call from a clinical psychologist at that medical center specializing in major diagnoses, then received some calls from a local pharmacy, then had calls to and from local cardiology groups, and finally, regular calls made to a home heart reporting hotline used for a specific medical device for monitoring for arrhythmia. We were able to confirm that individual had an arrhythmia. So there's diagnosing a medical condition just using a person's phone metadata. Let me give one more example. Uh, we had one of our participants who had re made regular phone calls to a local firearm sales and repair store, uh, and then uh, made some uh, lengthy calls to uh, a customer service line for that company. The store specialized in the AR-15 assault rifle. That company made a model of the AR-15 assault rifle, one of their most common products. We were able to confirm that person owned that, that type of assault rifle made by that specific manufacturer, just using phone metadata. So our working hypothesis is that, in fact, phone use is much more common in certain sensitive sectors. For example, medicine, law, where notoriously, they're kind of backwards about using information technology. And by focusing on phone metadata, in fact, the government may have access to really sensitive information about ordinary Americans. So uh, that concludes what I wanted to say about our research results. If you're curious uh, to learn more, we are running a class uh, right now on Coursera uh, that you can take. Uh, includes uh, a lot about the data we've collected as well as the law that governs this area.